Okay, I think uh, we'll get started with the, the next speaker. So I'd like to introduce uh, Sergio and Patrick from Intel, who are going to give an introduction and overview on a VPP. Yeah, that's when I have mic. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sergio Gonzalez Monroy. I'm a network software engineer at Intel, and I work on uh, VPP and DPDK projects. On the first half of this presentation, I'll be talking uh, about VPP. I'll give a, an overview and an example of how you can modify and create new nodes. Um, for the second half, Patrick is going to talk about practical uh, analysis of VPP uh, on interarchitecture and some uh, recommendations. So this will be the agenda. Uh, like I said, um, I'll talk high-level overview of how VPP works uh, and, and the, the functionality and features that it provides. Um, I'll give an example of how to modify it and, and adding graph nodes. And in this case, it will be the, the work that I did for VPP integrating CryptoDev. Um, it will be as a plugin, so we'll see all, all the stuff that you can do with, with plugins. Uh, I'll also talk about the, the performance and how VPP can scale, basically almost linearly. Um, and uh, a final summary. So VPP. VPP stands for Vector Packet Processor. Um, as you probably all know, it's a, it's a project inside the FIDO Foundation, and there are and other projects inside FIDO. Um, it's been, it's been in, in development since 2002, open source since 2016, uh, and it runs in commodity hardware. Uh, it's fast, it's scalable, and consistent. It can do up to uh, 40 million packets per second per core, uh, no packet loss, um, and it has a, a scalable and hierarchical FIB, uh, which provide great uh, performance and an update. It's also optimized for, for this commodity hardware, so it can take advantage of DPDK for I.O., now also ODP. It can take advantage of vector instructions depending on the platform you're running, so from SSE, AVX, AVX2, or NEON in, in ARM. And it's also optimized for instruction per cycle. So at the end of the day, it's all about performance. Um, it runs in a multi-core uh, platform, and, and it takes the, the, the main concept would be batching uh, packets uh, and being cache and memory efficient. So uh, it runs in a run-to-completion run to model, whereas um, every core runs like a, like a copy of this graph node uh, that VPP is. Um, we avoid context switch. It's all running in user space, so there is no mode switching, um, and there is no blocking. Everything is lockless uh, on the data path. Um, as you can see, it, it's extensible and flexible uh, design. Uh, so the, the whole idea is implemented as a direct graph node. Uh, that, as, as you can imagine, it allows you to create new nodes, reconfigure the whole graph node as you, as you need. Um, and it provides also an easy mechanism as a plugin. Uh, so you don't need to directly modify the BPP sources. It, it provides you a mechanism to add your own nodes uh, and to put them into the overall uh, BPP graph node. It provides uh, control plane, CLI, um, and it's very developer friendly. So, this for, for those developing uh, application at this level, uh, I found that it was uh, invaluable. Um, it provides packet tracing, so you can see the packet going through all the nodes at, all the, at any time. Uh, every node uh, can provide different information uh, for that packet. It provides error counters, uh, cycle counters, so you can see the average uh, <clears throat> number of cycles spent per packet on every node. So it's very easy to identify. So if one of the nodes, uh, or you, the, the node that you are implementing, uh, has a very high cost on, on the whole packet uh, for that uh, traffic uh, workload. Um, it's, it's running, like I mentioned before, it's running in user space, and it can be used with a common uh, developer and two chains, just GCC or, or C line. It's a full feature. Uh, implementation, so we have full L2, L3 implementation, also now L4 with TCP and UDP. Uh, it provides uh, CLI, uh, ba basic IGV2, 
And, and it's integrating in, in different ways. So as I mentioned in the previous presentation, so there is a Netcov Yang for ODL. We have a Python API for Kubernetes Flannel uh, and different language bindings like uh, Java or Python. <coughs> I think now also there is a REST agent for uh, Neutron on OpenStack. Uh, and we have uh, OSB packaging from different vendors such as uh, Ubuntu or Red Hat. So how does this work? Um, so the, the most relevant, we have two most relevant type of nodes, right? Uh, internal nodes and, and input nodes. The input nodes will be those nodes that inject packets into these graph nodes, um, which usually are gonna be your, your uh, can be IO if it's a DPDK input. In the case of DPDK input, it will be direct IO for interfaces, re and next. It could be AF packet input or um, it could be from any other offload or, or uh, FPGA or NIC that you may have. Um, so once, once we get a, a bunch of packets from one of those graph nodes, we move them through the graph node in vectors. Uh, a vector basically is just a, a, a collection of packets, a bunch of packets that we're reading at any given time. Um, once we get them from the input nodes, like I mentioned, Depending on the packets that we have, they will get classified and they will go to different nodes. So if we have uh, Ethernet inputs that they are not IP, they will go to the Ethernet input node. But if, if from the input node we have um, a flag identifying the packet as an IP packet, it will go directly to the IP node, so we're saving cycles that way. So it can take advantage of the different uh, functionality that your NIC will have uh, and leverage that, that of loading and capabilities. Once all, once all the vector packet is, is flushed out, right? So this, like I said, it goes through packets. So if we get, let's say, 200 packets, we work on those 200 packets until they have been out of the graph. That could be because we're dropping the packets or because we're uh, doing TX on one of the output interfaces. So it's optimized for uh, cache and memory efficient, as I mentioned before. The idea here is that each node uh, will fit in the instruction cache. So when you get a bunch of packets, that the functionality in that node will be a specific. So it will be in your instruction cache. You wouldn't have a, a, a instruction cache miss, and you will then use prefetching to get the packets uh, and, and execute that functionality on the node, then move to the next node, or uh, multiple nodes. So I mentioned before the, the input nodes and the internal nodes. So here, the in green one will be the input nodes, and in blue will be internal nodes. Um, the way that you configure each node, each node needs to know what are the next possible nodes. So you don't know where the, 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 previous, the packets come from or from which node packets come from, but you need to know the packets that they're going to. Um, the plugin mechanism is, is, is very easy and they're first class citizens, right? So even if you are a plugin, you can add APIs, you can add uh, CLI commands, you can add uh, uh, new nodes, and you can rearrange the graph in a different way. So you don't need to modify VPP itself, you can do it as a plugin. In this case also, uh, DPDK is implemented as a plugin. Um, so we can create input nodes as a plugin or other internal nodes. So now I'll go through the example. So this is the, the work I did for uh, integrating the CryptoDev DPDK API, which basically is a crypto API uh, for the IPsec implementation that uh, VPP already had. So the idea here will be to modify the DPDK plugin itself. Uh, we will create new nodes and we'll re rearrange the graph uh, to take advantage of those nodes. So initially, uh, if we, I'll just go by the, this will, be, this will be the default path that you will take, uh, you know, with, without other encapsulations for normal IP packets that are gonna get, get encrypted. Uh, we will get a, a vector of packets from the DPDK input node. The next, because the NIC likely will, will recognize that there were IP packets, uh, it will go directly into the IP4 input uh, node, no checksum. Uh, so in that node, basically, there's a bit of, you know, uh, IPv4, header, sanity, and, and TTL decrement. So then we go to the FIB. Uh, the FIB will say, okay, this packet needs to be um, 
encrypted, so we will go to a virtual interface, a virtual IPsec interface, right? Which is the IPsec IF output. When we go there, basically we're gonna say, okay, we need to encapsulate this packet with ESP and encrypt it. That will happen by default on VPP with OpenSSL. And once we have a new uh, tunnel IP header, we go back to the uh, FIP to find out what is the output interface, what is the, the new L2 that we need to rewrite and, and out to the TX packet. So uh, we modified the DPDK plugin to provide uh, new nodes. Those new nodes were the DPDK crypto input, which is another input node that will be pulling from the crypto devices that DPDK exposed. Um, we have a DPDK ESP encrypt because we do the encapsulation slightly different and then we enqueue those packets down, down to uh, DPDK and another uh, DPDK ESP encrypt pause, which basically just uh, gets some metadata. So the moment that we create those nodes and the plugin gets registered, uh, as you can see, there is no connection from the IPsec interface output to that new node. So those nodes are registered, they are there, but they, are, they, they won't be packets being routed towards. Uh, that decision will happen later. Um, so we can't do that on runtime, right? On runtime, there are APIs that provide us to check, okay, do we have crypto devices? Yes, then we can reconfigure the node on runtime to take advantage of those. If VPP doesn't, uh, find any crypto devices, he could use the default OpenSSL implementation that he already provides. So as you can see, this, the plugin is, is very powerful and it allows you to, to do basically whatever and adapt to different platforms and, and functionality that you may have. So th this is BPP um, performance uh, data. So it's from the CC project which is another FIDO project that continues system integration and testing. Um, and it's basically shown uh, the scaling of VPP. Uh, in, the, in the left side, we have uh, one million uh, entries for IPv4, and on the right side is IPv6, half a million entries. As you can see, the scaling of interfaces and, and cores is almost linear. And, and you can see that the limit here uh, is the bandwidth of the NICs and the, the PCI and not the not VPP or the course. Um, so this is running on a dual socket uh, system, uh, Intel processor E5 with uh, 256 gigabytes of memory and uh, six Intel XL710, which is a dual port for the gig NIC. Um, <coughs> so as a summary, I think that the main thing to remember is VP is fast, it's scalable, and it's very flexible. It's developer friendly. Uh, it has full feature L2, L3 implementations, also now L4 implementation with TCP and UDP. Um, it's easy to integrate for your necessity and to modify it. Uh, you can have your own node or you can work upstream, um, and it has a great community uh, very involved. Um, so that will be for me. If there are any questions, I'll take, the, I'll take them later, uh, and I'll let Patrick first get with the second half of the presentation. Thank you. Oh, this USB is also needed. Yeah, 
Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming here today. So my name is Patrick Liu, and I'm from Intel's Network Platform Group uh, based in Arizona. So uh, just very brief uh, uh, background about our team and uh, myself. So we are the performance analysis team, very focused on IO performance analysis for like, like the past 15 years. So uh, myself in the team for almost seven years now. So we have a very uh, deep understanding of PCIe architecture, um, like we're using protocol analyzer to look at every packet. But uh, uh, throughout the time, we also develop various methodology like uh, using hardware counter or software technique to get uh, this kind of I.O. Uh, measurement insight, right? So today I'm going to share with you a couple of practical tools as well as uh, techniques for identifying I.O. bottleneck as well as on the CPU side, um, on the core side. If uh, anything that um, goes wrong, how do we spot it? And then a couple of tips on how to um, improve performance. Okay. So uh, the presentation is going to be uh, break into two parts. It's on core and core. And I know maybe not every one of you are familiar with this terminology, so I'll have a graphic pre uh, representation in the next slides. But basically, I want to show you how to measure PCIe bandwidth, memory bandwidth, using a set of hardware counters. And of course, the open source tool or how to get to it is nothing proprietary. Also, on the CPU side, uh, if there's uh, um, IPC instruction per cycle, it's a common matrix, but a couple of things maybe um, for, for, for the uh, people new uh, Intel architecture may not be aware. And also, um, some other things to help div dive into deeper into IPC. Right. So this is kind of a, a diagram of a, a modern uh, Intel Xeon so server CPU. So uh, I break it up based in two parts. There's a, a yellow part for the CPU, uh, the core side, which is comprised of uh, execution unit, layer one, layer two, right? And there can be multiple cores that run uh, independently and then simultaneously. And the blue part is basically where on core, on this means everything not core, we call on core. So um, the uh, C, like a modern CPU, um, surprisingly, like uh, the core is actually the efficient part of it. So the main real estate was the uh, last level cache. So it can be up to 55 megabyte, right, on the fourth generation, or memory controller, I/O, all these kind of peripheral. But the peripheral today, especially in our domain, the network processing is really actually the key for interacting with the world, right? So uh, we need to have a good tools to uh, get more visibility into the on-core space. Okay. Yep. Um, and then uh, the purpose of this slide is not to go through all the bullet points, uh, although you're certainly welcome to visit this because this show very complex of uh, interaction between CPU and I.O. for a basic life cycle of a packet, how it goes into a general purpose CPU, right? But really, the takeaway here is I want to highlight the traditional our performance methodology is very uh, core-centric. That means we look at IPC, we look at branch prediction rate, we look at TLB or hit or miss, those kind of things, very from CPU perspective. But with uh, the, um, our workloads, right, I.O. very central, we need to have a a new ways or new methodology to look at IO century workloads. So yeah, let's jump in into the practical things. So today for my main uh, uh, tools, I'm going to uh, mention for processor counter monitoring or PCM. It's a tool I co-develop with other Intel uh, software developer. It's open source now in GitHub. Uh, basically, it, it has a very lightweight of a set of lightweight user space tool that program our um, hardware performance counter, but uh, they um, display in a very high level abstracted. So uh, it has a formula to convert. So you can, for example, just from a glance of view, see memory bandwidth or um, various level of cache miss ratio. So you don't have to do all those conversion by yourself. Uh, also, it will have a, um, like a C or C++ API if you want to do a, like a next level integration your, into your workload to um, get a more fine region by region kind of uh, uh, performance insight. It has an API allow you to do that, um, and it's uh, uh, BSD licensed. 
So uh, I understand not all of the in, uh, deploy environment uh, can install or deploy custom tools, so, but Linux Perf is probably pretty ubiquitous. So in the backup slide here, I will provide like a, a sample command line, so you can do a similar profiling with a up-to-date kernel, means 4.0 4 plus, uh, with a set of wrappers, so you can accomplish a similar thing with a Linux Perf utility. So just a brief word about uh, PCIe. So ever since uh, our first generation E5 processor, uh, we had introduced technological uh, data direct I.O., right, DDIO. So maybe many of you uh, already uh, have a f first uh, hands experience with it. But um, it's basically whenever you have I.O., DMA, uh, read or write transactions or your network receive, transmit, Instead of uh, uh, going into memory directly, it now will go straight into last level cache. So the advantage is in twofold. So if uh, uh, CPU can consume the packet directly, your latency is much quicker, right? It's at least twice the saving compared to going out to the memory. A second, if uh, that is indeed the case, your memory controller could be practically keep at most idle. So if you're idle, the memory controller can um, like a power down or run at a lower frequency so you can save platform level power, right? But there's uh, some condition where uh, the packet right into last level cache will still eventually get evicted to the memory and then I'll show you how to catch that and what are the ways uh, to avoid it. So um, yeah, to, to kind of major PCI bandwidth, it's pretty simple to get started. So you just download a tool and then uh, run the make commands and then invoke PC and PCIe. And uh, there's some cryptic name here, uh, but so I, I kind of highlight in the four point takeaway. Um, let me just get a list. Yeah. So the uh, first thing is uh, oh, by the way, uh, because of the <laughs> time constraint. I probably couldn't go into uh, the lowest level detail today, but we are going to have a white paper coming out, explain all this in much greater detail. And a Sergio and I, we are also available after the talk. So if there's a, a deep question I didn't cover, we can certainly uh, grab a whiteboard after that. So four points to take away is uh, uh, you can use in uh, looking at the right event to measure your inbound right. So that is your network receive, whether you have a full cache line or it's a, a NAS cache line that's like 64, NAS 64 by a line is called read for ownership. It's in, inbound right. Um, and then there's also the transmit path. So you want to send a packet out to the network interface to, to the wire that will trigger the uh, PCI recur events. And MMIO here is basically your outbound operation. CPU wants to um, uh, address, like, a, uh, either reading the status from the device, a PCI device, or want to notify the device to uh, start initiate asynchronous DMA operation for, like, a, a receive or transmit. So what you want to kind of do with once you know what you can measure, what you basically want to do is. Uh, um, Want to match uh, your I/O throughput, for whatever you expect it with this reliable hardware counter. Because uh, um, as as you you get more experience to develop uh, like a packet processing on general processor, you, you may not need to do this as often. But uh, initially, like uh, I have, we have seen a couple cases from customer where they forget to include in. They were using uh, like a a storage device, PCI NVMe, to store uh, data coming from the wire, or they're using hardware uh, crypto accelerator. So they didn't consider that part also using uh, PCI bandwidth, equivalent of PCI bandwidth. So you are hitting basically PCI bandwidth limit. Uh, so you, it's like really 1.5x or sometimes 2x on the wire for every packet coming into the system. So it's a good idea to just calibrate um, your IO bandwidth, your workload, make sure there's no surprise. Right, and then uh, come to the MMIO right. It seems DPDK. I think this concept is kind of uh, um, well understood, but to just batch your MMIO right operation because uh, um, you want to save those available PCI bandwidth more for the receive transmit function, not just this kind of uh, uh, doorbell signaling uh, steps, right? And the orange part is like a what you want to avoid. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a 
time to go to the great detail, but this one is absolutely I want to call out because MMIRE, uh, um, probably I don't know about other architecture, but on Intel architecture is very uh, long latency operation, right? It can easily take up to 200 cycles for each single single read, and there's very little uh, technique you can hide those kind of uh, long latency, like pipeline, out of order, it, it doesn't work with MMIRE, so avoid MMIRE at, at all costs, right? Okay, so coming to uh, major memory bandwidth, it's as easy as the PCM, PCIe, just uh, compile and run PCM memory. So what I want to highlight here is a typical, um, like a, a fully loaded two socket configuration, right? There have three main components here. You have the CPU, you have the memory, and you have the uh, IO devices. So all three of them have to be aligned on the same socket. If not, they can introduce some memory traffic, and not only that, they can introduce latency, right? So when you see memory traffic um, in the system, well, if you know it's best, but when you do see, these are the kind of three common uh, reasons you do see them. Um, if you have a wrongly allocated new map for your, uh, any of the three components, then try to fix it in the code or uh, isolate it, right? So, um, and uh, if you have a DDIO miss, that means uh, the packet, every packet is coming into last level cache, but if they don't get uh, consumed by the code um, fast enough, the, old, the new one come will evict the old one out to the memory. So it means try to process or move this packet um, as, as fast as you can. And the, the second thing I, I highlight here, although I, I talked to Sergio, was uh, it's not uh, universally applicable, but um, it, it, it's one of the tuning techniques to, uh, to, to basically size in your descriptor ring uh, a size, so like a, you, uh, you can be typically 1K for RX descriptor or similar for up to 4K, right? So the bigger you, you, you size your descriptor ring, you can absorb more packet and probably avoid packet loss, right? But on the uh, contrast, when you have a larger descriptor ring size, you basically um, given uh, the chance you have more packet uh, buffer in the system, and more system, uh, more packet buffer in the system can have a, a more likelihood of causing collisions. So size that descriptor ring appropriately, like don't just say 4K, it's, it's good for every test case. It may be okay for 20 gig, 40 gig, but if you scale to 100 gig, 140, 160 gig, you, you have, may have to look at system uh, level and then um, uh, reduce the descriptor ring size Per, per device accordingly. Uh, finally, actually, it's actually most prime, the most common way you see memory traffic was where you have a hash or your lookup table, depending on the size of it and then how well they can be uh, cached into your uh, local level cache. If, if it's very big, there's a highly likelihood you will get it from the memory, right? But if they are streaming, means uh, they are all coming in in a pipeline fashion, you might be okay, but if not, then uh, it can uh, occur latency, impact your performance. So uh, check for latency. So yeah, kind of the takeaway here from the kind of uh, encore side was the uh, first, and also it's from the easiest to the most advanced to, to address it was to calibrate your IO bandwidth uh, with your expected performance with this uh, uh, hardware counter available to you, right? And also check for unexpected cross NUMA traffic, like if you have only single socket uh, system and you will never run into this issue, but if you are scaling now, run, run your same workload on just the second CPU plugin, if you don't have this NUMA API to allocate right kind of things, you suddenly will see performance drop uh, where you don't know where it's from. Just look at memory bandwidth. And uh, avoid MMIRE, as I say, the long latency instruction, batch MMIRE, and uh, hopefully we can see each other another time to say how we can optimize software to best use of DDIO. That's a very uh, kind of advanced topic. Uh, okay, so moving into the uh, core side, I kind of uh, prepared this uh, interesting uh, tool very big number here for, for the audience to, to take a quick uh, um, a look. So this is basically a VPP 1704 running two different configuration. And then first, uh, using perf, give me IPC number of 2.63. The second one, give me 2.12. So which one do you think has the um, highest throughput per core? Right. 
it generally IPC, the higher the better, right? And then uh, it is uh, kind of say you have higher IPC, you have a higher throughput. So the reality is, <laughs> Um, so the, um, what I hear actually is the A was that kind of uh, prior to 1701, we don't have a crypto dev. Uh, uh, it's just an optimized VPV IPsec using open SSL versus the B is using uh, ASNI crypto dev accelerate. Despite our IPC slightly come down, IPC is really just a ratio between instruction divided by cycles, right? Uh, but uh, surprisingly to me also, the traditional one is probably uh, very, uh, there's a lot of uh, layers of uh, um, processing to do to, to accomplish the similar functionality. It takes an average of more than 15,000 instructions per packet to get the IPsec uh, encryption to, to accomplish its job. So even though the IPC is tuned, it's very like a well-designed uh, dual loop and prefetching this kind of technique to make IPC very smooth, simply because the amount of code has to be applied for every IPsec packet. It just causing huge number of uh, cycle per packet, right? Whereas uh, in the crypto dev, we also introduce more direct path to accomplish the same IPsec way. We only have to do 1,800 instruction per packet in average, and that in turn reduce uh, um, our cycles per packet by six times, and that's your speed up in performance. So uh, the kind of the takeaway is uh, IPC is really just a ratio. So unless it is really poor, like a less than one or something that can indicate really um, big, bigger issue. But if anything is closer to two or above two, we look at instruction per packet or cycle per packet. That will be a better uh, core matrix for comparing performance. And that's also nice uh, cycle per packet if you change into different skew with different frequency. Uh, it's still kind of uh, you can scale it uh, appropriately. So uh, beyond IPC, how can we zoom into more to understand where is the CPU bottleneck, right? So this is where I want to spend a few minutes uh, talk about processor trace. It's basically a new hardware since uh, fourth generation processor, but it's also applicable in uh, our Denver term, uh, Atom based micro server. So it's pretty uh, 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 good. Uh, like you, you can use it on different class of uh, machines. But you can think it's basically it's a hardware that, that's like a, a branch tracer. So without um, any kind of condition, if statement for loop or anything, uh, it will uh, basically, uh, the, the call, the CPU is just going to fetch next instruction, next instruction, execute forever. But uh, whenever, whenever you have if condition, it's based on the runtime condition, right? Your packet size, your, uh, your uh, packet header content, all those decide where you go. So this is a branch tracer can reveal uh, this kind of exact ex execution path of how your program was executed. So this is a, a dynamic uh, tracing technique. You can, like uh, you have analyzer in your CPU, free one. <laughs> Okay, so the, uh, there's also just a couple words mentioned in the integration with like uh, ubiquitous Linux perf tools, right? And uh, button here, you kind of see this is a, a flame graph of uh, uh, various transition for different function that, that, that is uh, doing complex uh, processing. But um, really the takeaway here is the Linux perf with like a modern kernel 4.4, like Ubuntu 16.04, or, or, or newer, then uh, it has like out of box support for this uh, uh, hardware support. So it can give you like a finest detail, like how your code was executed, but you need to do some post processing to reduce the tracing data because even for one millisecond of uh, trace, it gives you like a maybe more than 20 million instruction. That's like uh, maybe thousands of uh, loop iteration of your, um, uh, your, your packet processing, right? So reduce that is kind of a uh, kind of data <laughs> analytic uh, subject too. So here is just kind of uh, um, another like uh, uh, interesting demonstration of processor trace ap applying to VPP, how we can get more insight for performance uh, um, optimizations, right? So uh, this chart you can think of is uh, it's 
like a VPP trace, so you show, you, you see like a, when packet was coming for receiving and then doing various nodes processing and transmit out, but at even finer granularity. So I abstract it out here to show the key component, but you can really trace into at instruction granularity what happened to uh, your packets, right? So the first thing to call out here was uh, we have a, a vector with uh, 256 packets, and um, for people that understood DPDK, we are, every receive is 32 packets, so if we want to gather that many packets in the vector, we have to call it A times, A times 32, 256. So you can see if your yeah, CPU is, is fully loaded or not, or like a, the amount of traffic coming, are they bursty or they are very uh, scattered. Similar thing, transmit out, we receive 256, we want to send 256 out. TX, we are bursting at 16, so you call it 16 uh, times to get to that uh, uh, vectors. And then here, okay, you can also see where are the most densest uh, function in your code. So VPP provide cycle per node, but here basically provides you how many instruction per node you are doing. So because instruction is kind of uh, what the programmer write, write C code that generates assembly instruction, and then cycle per capita is kind of the amount of time to execute in this work. So with this amount of uh, detailed information, you can kind of uh, <laughs> see where you need to spend your effort for the next level optimization, right? Or if the uh, hardware offload come to the picture, this can also tell you where, where you may need to consider hardware offload if really we exhausted all the um, software options. Uh, and then another final thing to call out was uh, actually this is, was unexpected, but throughout the preparation of this uh, um, presentation, we found out the, the, the typical way of launching VPP did not use the most optimal, or actually I should say most minimum receive path because uh, uh, the, the, the uh, initialization parameter passing from VPP to DPDK was 9K for the max packet size, so uh, DPDK just choose to use scatter as a receiving pass, right? So this kind of thing is good to call out that you may not notice at the compilation time or development time, but when you're really doing the benchmarking, here will show you what functions are get called at runtime. Okay, so really kind of to summarize uh, um, everything uh, that we quickly gone through today was to using your available performance uh, monitoring hardware to baseline your workload performance, right? There's a, a rich set of tools available open sourcely for you, PCM or Linux perf, and then uh, uh, really to improve performance is two, two uh, main factors, right? Whether we can reduce instruction count per packet, by creating more VPP, direct VPP path to processing packet. The IPC slide was a great example of how a, a very st structured way can take very long instruction per packet, but if you understood what your end goal is, maybe we can take a more shortcut, like implement plugin to process that directly. Uh, also consider hardware offload whenever the, yeah, you exhaust the um, uh, optimization from the software perspective, right? So reduce cycles per packet is kind of, uh, um, um, yeah, it, it's the, the, the meaning is very clear, but to do it, you can kind of uh, go through the on-call performance takeaway side to kind of minimize your latency as much as possible. And then uh, one thing we did not cover here today, but it's kind of uh, good to keep in mind was uh, the CPU L1 missed latency. Uh, if we measure those, we can kind of get the residency view, like basically your data structure, are they mostly cached in L2 or in LLC or memory? So that will give us indication um, which hash table we have to optimize. And then uh, there's a lot of reference for you to download a tool or um, documentations. Yeah, thank you. Uh, which one? Uh, oh, this one. Uh, sorry, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, what time is it? By the way, there's a wire stream question for, for me or for Patrick.
Hi, thank you for the presentation. My question will be in the sense of virtualization using VMs and containers, leveraging the, what you have presented. Do you have any performance benchmarking that you have run using containers and VMs, leveraging the user space flow graphs as well as your optimized, uh, optimized host, conf host configuration? Thank you. I think, I think the data that we have presented was all run. At least the one from the CC graph on a scaling BBB was on, on, the, on the host. So there was no virtualization uh, and containers. Uh, I think that if you look into the CC project, there might be some uh, use cases for containers. Usually containers at the moment, we are not doing the uh, SRIV uh, path at the moment. So it will be with uh, AF packet or uh, Bhost virtio. But I think there may be some, some performance information there. I don't know the, the, off the top of my head. Um. OK, I think that's it then. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.